good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Hi, I'm Ingrid Srinath, and I'm director of the Center for Social Impact and Philanthropy at Ashoka University. Welcome to this track on disrupting philanthropy. This, for those of you who are unfamiliar with CSIP, we are India's and in fact, South Asia's first and only academic center focused on social impact and philanthropy. We are part, of course, of the Ashoka University, which is India's pioneering private nonprofit liberal arts university. And our purpose really is to strengthen the ecosystem for philanthropy and civil society through building knowledge, networks, norms, and narratives. We are absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to host this track, and we're very deeply grateful to Nudge for providing such a critically needed platform. To start with, I'd like to take you back in a sense uh, to the early days of this pandemic, when the grim images of the devastation that it was causing, and in fact, the effects of it and the measure, the effects also of the measures that were taken or not taken to combat it are, I think, still seared in our memories, or they should be. Hopefully, we'll never forget the plight of millions of our fellow citizens who were reduced overnight to penury by this draconian lockdown that was announced with four hours notice or the scenes of migrant workers walking thousands of kilometers to return to their families. Hundreds, at least, as far as we know, perished before they could reach home. And then earlier this year, the sight of people gasping their last breaths at the doorsteps of hospitals while their families ran from pillar to post, offline and online, desperately seeking reliable information, hospital beds, medication, oxygen, even space in cemeteries and crematoria for their loved ones. Through these dark times, the people of India found hope and sustenance in each other, primarily, and in thousands of nonprofits and philanthropic organizations that stepped up to fill the gaps in our systems of public health and social protection. The examples are myriad from the big Indian foundations who mainly focused on the hardware gaps, ventilators, oxygen generating plants, PPE, temporary ICUs, isolation centers, to hundreds of businesses who redeployed their CSR budgets to either the PM Cares Fund or to NGOs providing direct relief to affected groups or indeed to the communities in which these businesses operate. And of course, tens of thousands of NGOs, as I mentioned, who prioritized the communities that they serve over their own safety and welfare, providing whatever those communities needed, even if it was entirely outside the NGO's mandate, sometimes even outside their competence and certainly beyond their financial resources. And they responded by providing not just immediate relief, but also ensuring that the stories of these migrant workers, of women subject to violence, of people with disabilities, of students cut off from learning, of transgender communities, sex workers, artists and artisans, child laborers and more were amplified and brought to public attention so that we could get both policy responses and philanthropic responses. And of course, there were these spontaneous informal groups of different professions that sprang up. Startup founders and investors, doctors, scientists, mental health practitioners, academics, each group focusing on redeploying their particular assets and strengths uh, to help in every way they could. I can't not mention the millions of diaspora Indians who mobilized not only themselves, but their communities, their employers, and in some cases, even their governments to send relief in cash, in kind, and by way of advocacy, despite the hurdles posed by new FCRA regulations. And of course, finally, the hundreds of thousands of citizens that we too often refer to as ordinary, who mobilized and delivered food, cash transfers, transport, information, and services online and offline in their neighborhoods and beyond. What we witnessed was this outpouring of humanity and empathy that actually is at the heart of the word philanthropy which means, of course, love of mankind. Let's look at a brief video that showcases some of these examples.
So this track at Cha Cha 2021 is dedicated to philanthropy. And it's going to focus over the next three days on how philanthropy in India is being changed by new entrants, new learning, new experiences, and of course, by technology. And it's also going to try and look at the ways in which philanthropy needs to change to measure up to the challenges and opportunities that we now collectively confront as a nation. The data, I think, are clear. Even before the pandemic, the development indicators for nutrition, education, gender, inequality, and more were starting to uh, show signs of regressing. The pandemic and all the collateral social and economic damage have, of course, exacerbated these. Depending on which report you're reading, it's 75 million more households pushed back below the poverty line, huge increases in unemployment, spikes in violence against women and children, child marriage, child labor, and massive losses in learning outcomes for children who have struggled not just to learn, but with stress, isolation, and mental health issues. And of course, the very sharp increase in inequality, to name just a few. Philanthropy in India has, unlike many other countries, remained relatively unmoved by the deep structural inequities that COVID-19 forced us to notice. But before these harrowing images fade completely from public memory, we do have a narrow window of opportunity to make radical policy change in areas from public health to education, to labor rights, to gender equity, and to social protection. In addition, there is the news from the IPCC report this week that has told us in no uncertain terms that our house is on fire. Extreme weather events across the globe have brought home the terrifying reality of an impending catastrophe. And then over and above all this, civil society itself, together with our democratic institutions and our founding values are under siege. One question I have for philanthropy is, will philanthropy in India continue to be largely a spectator to these unfolding existential crises? Or will it seize this moment to achieve the big systemic changes that are within our grasp? Finally, in several countries, grassroots movements are challenging philanthropy to examine itself more closely. They're asking questions about the diversity of the boards of foundations and their staff. They're asking questions about the way philanthropic endowments are invested. They're asking about the composition of their grant making portfolios and the explicit and implicit biases in their grant making norms and their grant making systems. Another question then for Indian philanthropy at this juncture is, is Indian philanthropy ready to turn a critical lens on itself or is it going to wait to be challenged from the outside? Over four sessions here at Chacha 2021, CSIP is going to bring you the people at the cutting edge of these disruptive changes in philanthropy. You will hear from and interact with new entrants to the philanthropic arena, from tech startups to citizen groups, from individuals and organizations working on some of the most underserved causes, to the progressive funders who are reshaping philanthropic norms, from those who are studying these changes most closely, to those deploying technology to accelerate impact and change. Today's session, our first, jump-starting philanthropy will feature some truly remarkable individuals. Each has responded to the pandemic with a game-changing new initiative that had massive impact. How will their new, fresh ideas and perspectives change the field of philanthropy as we know it? The session will be moderated by Shilpa Kumar. Shilpa is a partner at Omidya Network India, a social impact investment fund where she provides overall leadership, including strategy and investments across the areas of digital society, urban governance, access to justice and property rights. She also leads policy work in financial inclusion and in development of the nonprofit sector strategy. Prior to Omidyar's, Shilpa has spent more than three decades with the ICICI Bank Group, where she served as managing director and CEO of ICICI Securities, India's largest retail broker and a leading investment bank. She also holds too many board positions for me to list here today and serves on many regulatory committees, including SEBI's Sec Secondary Markets Advisory Committee, RBI's Technical Advisory Committee, RBI's Mohanty Committee on Monetary Policy and others. And in has hold, 
continues to hold positions in multiple industry bodies. Uh, among other things, uh, Shilpa and I share an alma mater, which is the Indian Institute of Management, Kolkata. Over to you, Shilpa. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Ingrid, um, for such a kind introduction. I just want to clarify that uh, some of the uh, regulatory committees, etc., were in the past, uh, so not, not a continuing uh, position. But otherwise, thank you very much, Ingrid, for such a kind uh, introduction. Um, I, I want to start off, uh, you know, uh, where Ingrid left off, uh, which is philanthropy, the meaning of the word, love, love of mankind. And it's really interesting that CSIP has juxtaposed that with another word, jumpstart. And uh, jumpstart to me, you know, evokes two different emotions, uh, despair, uh, distress, because something is not working, something has failed. Uh, and then the joy of actually seeing it start up and move forward. And I, I thought, therefore, it was really lovely to see uh, the, uh, you know, both these words put against each other and to uh, spend the next hour or so unpacking this with four uh, really interesting individuals. Uh, but before I do that, and, you know, I speak a little bit about what uh, Omidya Network India did, uh, may maybe I can uh, first start by describing what we do, because that will really explain how we address the COVID challenge. Uh, Omidya Network India, uh, our focus is the next half billion, uh, which is 60% of Indians uh, who we are at the bottom of the income pyramid, uh, the daily uh, wage earners, gig economy workers, migrants, small businesses. And what we do is really deploy the philanthropic capital of Pierre and Pam Umidyar um, in trying to solve at scale some of the most difficult challenges that people in this demographic face and that India faces. But when COVID happened, it was you know, a crisis of, I would say, a proportion and type that none of us have faced in our lifetimes. Uh, we realized that we needed to respond beyond our typical strategy, which is very sector focused and sector oriented. And we realized we had the advantage of having capital, which was flexible, uh, which could be deployed in different ways, which was also able to respond fast, given how we are structured. And, um, you know, uh, I, I just want to share with you how, therefore, we use this flexibility in very many different ways, depending on what we were facing. Uh, at first COVID, uh, first COVID wave, um, you know, we, we all know it was a, a economic and humanitarian crisis of large proportion, and it needed really swift response. And our way of responding to that was really, you know, to do an open call. Uh, to the first responders, which is uh, we saw a lot of NGOs in action working alongside government. And we said, OK, this is an open call. You tell us what you'd like to do and how you're doing it. And we'll try and get back to you as quickly as possible. Uh, that, that's the first thing. The second thing, when the second wave came, uh, it was much more a healthcare crisis, needed a very technical kind of response. So we responded to that differently. And I'll talk about each of them in detail in a moment. We also saw between the COVID-1 and 2 that there were two sets of communities who were much more affected than the others. Uh, that was the migrant community and the MSME in, in the business community. And therefore, we thought we needed to look at a response to this these two sets of communities in a very different way. So that was the third thing we did. And the fourth thing we did was really you know, our existing grantees who work within our strategies, uh, we decided that it was really important to help them respond uh, to, to their needs. And therefore, we just said, uh, what can we do to up their grants? And we came out with a solidarity grant. So these were the four sets of things we did. And I want to spend a moment or two on each of them. For COVID-1, the rapid response initiative we did, our open call, we got close to 2,000 applications. We had a crack team of four people who sifted through these, chose about 150, 
uh, and spending an average time of about 28 days on each of the applications that finally was successful, uh, we gave a, a total of 67 organizations funding, which totaled 0.75 crores. Uh, this funding, I must share with you, was you know very interestingly spread across 17 states. Uh, largely, of course, it went into relief because that was the need of the hour, right? Money, food, uh, livelihoods, that was the need of the hour, so it went into relief. But the balance also went into things like building awareness uh, and, and also sometimes to building backbones or coalitions in order to help the effort. The second thing we did, um, you know, was really the, the healthcare response. And our approach this time was very different because you know our teams themselves were impacted, teams of our grantees were impacted, and I think the response merited was of a completely different order, almost technical, like I said earlier, uh, and hence we responded with very focused set of two grants uh, of one point seven five million dollars each to two sets of people, give which we thought would be able to you know, crowd in lots more funding and deploy it at scale and to act uh, organization, which we also thought was capable of taking the money and uh, not just crowding in more money, but also again, able to act at scale. And the focus of both these efforts was really the healthcare uh, sector, the organizations, the people involved, doctors, nurses, paramedical staff, uh, 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 arranging equipment because that was also what was needed. Uh, and so our response was again, uh, swift, but directed to very different kinds of organizations. The last thing I want to talk about, uh, which I'm really, you know, particularly also uh, 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 passionate about is what we call our resolve initiative, uh, focused on migrant workers and MSMEs. And here the approach was, you know, it's a more medium term approach spread over 12 to 18 months. But here we looked for what we call lighthouse proposals. Each proposal that would take between half a million dollars to a million and a half dollars and would really bring together ecosystems of governments, civil society, donors, all with the objective of really shining the light on problems that were always there, but which very significant ways uh, during COVID. And we outlined, you know, specific strategy, published it, again, called for proposals, and sometimes went out, maybe even constructed proposals, uh, you know, to crowd in funding, as well as, you know, thought and action into each of these sectors. I, I want to conclude by saying, you know, we found some common threads across all these responses. Uh, and what we learned and how we responded, maybe five things, you know, if I can mention, and would love to exchange notes with uh, all the other speakers on this. The first thing was really that flexible capital really enhances and leverages the effectiveness on, of nonprofits. Uh, you know, I, I just want to share with you, we came across a nonprofit with, which had an annual budget of 150 crores, but was not able to even deploy 25 lakhs to enable its employees to work from home. Can you imagine that? And therefore, a simple act of 25 lakhs of unconditional money could leverage and really springboard the efforts of that whole organization. So, so the first thing was really flexible capital. Uh, number one. Number two was the fact that, you know, new funding was going to significantly decline for various different reasons. Maybe profits would be down, maybe CSR funding would be down. Uh, and at the same time, like Ingrid mentioned, there was going to be a lot of, you know, overseas capital looking to come in. And therefore, what we thought was, how do we strengthen the hands and strengthen those orgs capable of pooling donors uh, together, whether it be retail, whether it be NRIs, whether it be foreign funders. And therefore, we supported organizations like Give and Milap, uh, who are actually helping to make this happen. The third thing was really the increasing role of collaboration. And I, I thought it was just wonderful that the COVID moment encouraged, you know, not just uh, all of us as donors to come together and share ideas, share thoughts, 
exchange notes and crowding capital, but also it was great to see the NGO community come together. Uh, so someone like RCRC that we funded uh, came together organically during the crisis, pivoted its livelihoods work into migrant support work, helping them get home, um, and and uh, eventually has morphed into you know something which really uh, you know shares information and resources with partner NGOs, but also pulls back what's happening on the ground in the form of research. So that was the third third learning. The fourth was that behavioral change was so, so important. And therefore, it's not just important you know, to fund things like uh, livelihoods, but also to be able to fund things like creating awareness uh, amongst communities. Um, and, and again, we, we funded some you know, wonderful work which reached out in um, you know, local dialect to many, many people. I want to conclude by saying that something Omidyar has always been passionate about and got proven even more during this crisis is the use of technology, how it was the, uh, you know, really the leverage giving effect for so many nonprofits in a time at a time like this. Uh, so I, I just thought, let, you know, uh, with, with this, let me, you know, flip it back into the main discussion and welcome some wonderful people over here. I, I want to start by introducing uh, Mekin Maheshwari. And uh, you, know, you know, we say not just jump-starting, but disrupting philanthropy. And it's great to have over here Mekin, you and Ganesh, uh, both of whom have been disruptors in businesses first. Uh, you know, over the last 10 years, we've seen significant disruption in business You've both been party to that, been successful at that, and now, in a sense, pivoted into philanthropy. And uh, I, I think there's going to be some exciting stuff um, that you're going to be able to share with that hat on. And uh, just, just you know, for me to share with all our viewers, um, Mekin actually was one of the early employees at Flipkart, and then from there he proceeded to play various different roles in Flipkart, uh, eventually leaving. Um, uh, as head of HR. Uh, he then ran two small startups within Flipkart. And once he left, Flipkart actually has done a number of very interesting things. Uh, he started Udyam Learning Foundation, which works on developing entrepreneurial mindsets among youth from various backgrounds. Uh, and, and then he is also the co-founder of GAME, uh, which is uh, doing a uh, a lot of very catalytic things in the MSME space. Uh, most importantly, he's a very a key part of the ACT Foundation. Uh, and uh, Mekin would love to hear from you your own perspectives uh, on the new age philanthropic outlook as you started Udyam, and also you know your work with citizen collectives uh, as you run ACT grants. Uh, over to you, Mekin. Thank you, Shilpa. Very kind introduction. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, as Ingrid got us started in terms of uh, thinking of uh, what would shake us out uh, of the word languishing, uh, that became quite popular uh, during what all of us experienced at the pandemic. Uh, I feel uh, the story I want to share here, um, I want to speak about primarily uh, the journey of ACT grants, uh, because I feel what happened there is uh, gives me a lot of hope. Uh, and uh, it's been both an honor and privilege to be part of that journey. Uh, quick word about Udyam, uh, because and sticking to the topic and design of uh, of what Ingrid set up in this series of talks. Uh, I started with them, or in startup language, I bootstrapped with them. Uh, right? And I was fortunate enough to have capital with me uh, to be able to uh, set up an operating nonprofit that ran programs in schools, uh, hired facilitators, trained uh, them and tried to build entrepreneurial mindsets uh, and then part now partners with governments. 
And I think the model of uh, having that bootstrap capital and then a network of family and friends uh, who could support this initial model creation, um, which has now led to Udyam being in 10 states, partnering at scale. Um, and, and our laws uh, are not really helpful uh, to an early stage nonprofit where, hey, for the first three years, uh, you are denied access to many kinds of capital. So, so I feel this, uh, the space of early stage capital for nonprofits uh, is a space that requires dire disruption. Uh, and I know there are awards and grants that have come in, uh, which do uh, small bits, but as a supporter of uh, a large number of early stage nonprofit entrepreneurs, I also know that they don't do enough. Uh, like you win a, the largest of awards at about 10 lakhs and like with 10 lakhs, it's really hard to be able to build game changing systems, systems that will have systemic impact, require more capital, require more talent. And that, that's something that, uh, that's a thought I just wanna leave with the ecosystem. But with that aside, um, I'll, I'll talk us through the story of ACT. And if the platform permits me, it's my first time using Emit and happy to be using uh, an Indian startup product. Uh, if it permits me, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen. Uh, and please give me feedback uh, that it is something that's visible to you. Is the screen visible? Yes, it is. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Uh, so short set of slides to just quickly give you a picture of what's happening. So the reason ACT got started uh, was just that, yeah, that we had to act. We just couldn't continue to languish. Uh, a bunch of people got together. So the story of the starting of ACT was uh, there were a bunch of volunteer groups that had gotten started. Um, I was part of a small WhatsApp group uh, called Startups versus COVID. And that quickly ballooned to maximum size of WhatsApp, moved to Telegram. And parallelly, uh, Mohit, Shekhar, Prashant from the VC community had created a VC group. Um, and, and because we had probably started a little earlier, they asked me that, Megan, what can we do? And uh, how much money do you think we should raise for supporting causes that are fighting COVID? Um, I said, I don't know what it's going to take, but of the things that I can already see, like it's, it, it's of the order of 10 million. And in like a week's time, that group had raised 100 crores and said, okay, let's get started. Um, so that's basically how ACT started. Uh, a group of people uh, passionate about, hey, we want to do something around uh, the pandemic. We can't just sit and moved into action, raised capital, and then started deploying, right? Uh, quickly, I think the why behind it is that, hey, the journey, the decide to, I mean, while we are, while we were a up, those are the kind of people, hence we end up attracting. Uh, but we're working with a large array of people, and we believe that everybody can be a co-founder of social change. Um, and I think this is uh, is is something that like is deeply enabling and an intent to yeah. so exist. Uh, in so we are we are hopeful that we can actually uh, in as much hierarchy that uh, in the work that we see around us uh, around development uh, and that yes for most of us entrepreneurial ways of solving problems uh, and solving problems at scale in the startup way is what we know we believe that some bits of the startup way can actually be applied and be helpful to solving societal problems at scale. Like we've, we've learned a few things in scaling Flipkart or like building 
large organizations uh, figuring out hey out of hundreds of uh, possible uh, investments that you might make what do you look for and what might have a higher chance of success so people who are able to spot talent spot opportunity spot execution capability uh, a lot earlier and those people spending their time and energy on figuring out hey what might work uh, is really the startup way and willing to fail as a startup i feel that's been one thing that uh, we've carried through in our startup journeys and it's something that act carries through in what we try to do uh, i'm going to jump quickly to uh, what so yeah large number of people uh, it's been it, it's been amazing just how many people and i'm sure these numbers are outdated now uh, a lot more both people and organizations and funds and typically uh, in terms of media or to the outside uh, you generally hear of startups for their own funding uh, or you hear of vcs in terms of when they raise their rounds or when they fund a company uh, and you don't hear enough news about this like the heart that these people have and what they have done so i feel blessed to have the opportunity of representing all of these people and many more uh, on this platform to tell the story of what's possible so what uh, this is really the one slide that captures what we did um, but before i come to and you can read the numbers uh, but the stories behind it were that in when the first wave hit uh, there were about 5 6 of us which then slowly grew to about 8 9 of us we decided to meet every day um so it's it's somewhat unheard of to think about uh, daily ic meetings right uh, but that's that's what we thought was relevant and important because we were learning uh when we started operating uh we were like okay ventilators is what everybody says will fix this and as we started learning we we funded organizations that could double the impact of ventilators uh divide one ventilator to be used by two patients at the same time we we learned that contact tracing was important we funded organizations that could enable contact tracing we funded organizations that could enable drones for communication uh and there was obviously a technology bias in what we were doing uh, both from a scale and leverage point of view and also just from the network and the world we came from but most importantly the daily ic meetings really helped us question each other and ask what was working what was not working uh, the virus was mutating its impact on the country was mutating and it was important to keep knowing that what's working what's not working to admit that things that we've done have not worked and we need to do something different and we need to like keep evolving uh, hence we needed to mutate uh, and i feel there the daily ic meetings helped a lot uh, a bunch of people coming together with uh, with no personal agendas uh, right and really questioning each other and having heated arguments heated debates about what might be better use of this philanthropic capital um and when i think about it the uh, the money deployed uh, so act deployed about 11 million dollars in 2020 um the money deployed isn't necessarily uh, isn't necessarily massive compared to the catastrophe that the country faced uh, but in some areas the impact that it created both at the time because urgency was super important uh, as we were operating as well as uh, the the sustainable solutions it's left behind um, and i want to talk about just couple of uh, scale solutions that have been left behind uh, one is an organization called swast which is a collaborative of health organizations that was incubated by act and then has gone on and in wave 2 played a large role with act itself uh, but now uh, is is really a collective that's helping both shape thinking as well as implementation of a lot of health in primary health infrastructure along with other things 
The second organization was step one, uh, a bunch of volunteers coming together to provide a, a remote call center solution uh, to be able to enable governments, nonprofits, others to be able to reach to people and for people to be able to reach uh, a doctor. Uh, they have they quickly onboarded 7,000 plus doctors who were able to answer queries in last time I heard about 50 plus dialects. Uh, and that for India is extremely important. Uh, use technology to be able to distinguish uh, what were like what were high urgency calls that needed a very quick response versus things that could things that could be done later. Uh, so both of these organizations, Step One and SWAS, that we uh, enabled, funded early in uh, 2020, have gone on to create uh, national scale impact and. I think as, as enablers, as supporters, uh, these successful entrepreneurs is what gives us most joy and most pride that oh, these people have been able to create a lot. I, I think from in terms of the principles we were operating with, uh, besides the principle of speed and learning, which is reflected in the daily ICs that carried on between April to June and most of July of last year, and then moved to twice a week. Uh, and we continue to do uh, weekly ICs now. Uh, I think a key principle was a trust in entrepreneurs. And having spent five plus years now in the development sector and a good amount of time in the startup sector, I do want to bring up that in the startup ecosystem, uh, the entrepreneur is the hero of the story. Uh, it's sad to say that I don't find that happening in the nonprofit sector. It's um, it's it's very unfortunate because it's the entrepreneurs who are who are putting their putting their effort and stretching and being on ground and making hard decisions, making choices, and for them to not be trusted, for them to not be the hero, uh, is unfortunate. Uh, and I feel like that's one thing that this. The startup VCs, uh, both the entrepreneurs and VCs, were able to bring into act that for us, the entrepreneurs were the heroes. And our role was how much can we enable them? How quickly can we enable them? Uh, Sanjay Vijay Kumar, who's the entrepreneur behind Corona Safe, uh, the model that uh, implements technology in large parts of Kerala, uh, right? And for him, like he had the answers, he knew what to be done. And then one conversation with Shekhar, and he has 50 lakh in the account in 48 hours, uh, allows him to move at the speed that the pandemic response needed. And I think that trust um, is extremely important. And I feel like that's one of the founding principles behind ACT, that, hey, we fund entrepreneurs. And it is the entrepreneur who will then go ahead and drive stuff. Uh, I think the second piece was that we were co-problem solvers. We were co-creators, and it wasn't just about the money. For like for most of us, like eleven million is not going to solve very large problems. But how do you then apply the thinking capacity of a large number of people uh, who can think scale, who can think systems change, who have networks and connections that otherwise are very hard to find, to be able to go about making that change? So whether it's government connections getting collaboratives built, et cetera. I think making that happen uh, was amazing. And I think finally, uh, a key principle that we looked for is scale and leverage, uh, right? And this gets borrowed from the startup ecosystem that, hey, what has potential to grow 20X? What has potential to create impact for many, many lives? Uh, because the philanthropic money available is actually uh, a few drops and they have to, yeah, they have to wet a very large amount of dry land. So how do you make that happen has been something that uh, has been a cornerstone of how ACT has operated. Uh, quickly, yeah, this is, this is what we did in wave two. Um, and and I'll, now, I'll now quickly jump to maybe three or four. So this was the team that did it. And it's, it's been inspiring to see the kind of operational support uh that that came in from uh, from all kinds of people right from consultants from as in other startups uh nonprofits governments to be able to make all of this happen uh 
I, I want to leave us with like quick uh, two or three stories. Uh, so first was just when we, as we started um, to move at this speed, the speed at which we saw others move, uh, right? And like Amazon supported a deploying of oxygenation devices. And those decisions were made in hours, uh, right? And things were, things were acquired, things were shipped. Uh, there were volunteers who quickly came in place tracking. There were volunteer organizations that came in in terms of, hey, the plans for deployment of these devices, how do we ensure that they reach where they're supposed to, et cetera. Uh, we had global CSRs and often uh, philanthropy and CSR is blamed with slow action or inaction. And we got decisions in a week for crores of rupees. Uh, from some of the largest global uh, CSRs. And, and in my head, I feel the learning is that, hey, if there is a need, if there is a crisis, and if you have, uh, if you've thought through deployment that will create real impact, uh, there is, there are human beings inside these organizations willing to change how these organizations work. I think the last story, uh, which I find the most impactful uh, is the question forward here on the slide, which is uh, in wave two, we realized that uh, we needed to get oxygen to remote parts of the country as soon as possible. Uh, we found the oxygen concentrators to be the device which only needed electricity and water to operate. And uh, we also had Natchiket who had served at PMGF and hence uh, who could tell us about them also building long-term capacity for future. Now, we needed to do this, but the only manufacturing for these OCs happens to be in China. And at the time that we started reaching out to our connections in China, we were realizing that they wanted upfront cash to place an order. Right? And we wanted OCs as fast as possible. So how do you, how do you get all of that upfront cash? And... And it's been amazing to see uh, unicorns that you mostly hear of in terms of their own growth and their funding and so on, willing to willing to lend us money uh, on just personal guarantees, uh, lending us millions of dollars to go place those orders that, hey, we can't wait. Uh, because like the cost of every day of delay when people were gasping for oxygen uh, was, was many, many lives. So to see, to see people uh, who you would possibly never expect. Uh, or, and even for them, the ask was crazy, but it's like, hey, people needed it. Humanity needed it, the country needed it, and they did it. So for me, these are stories, uh, these are stories of hope and change and of disruption of what's possible uh, if there are well-meaning people who come together to figure that, hey, what is it that uh, we can do? And for most of us, we are learning. Uh, like we don't know philanthropy. Uh, and our attitude today continues to be the same attitude that we had on, our, on day one of ACT, which is we were going to figure out most of this by doing. We will make many mistakes. We are willing to go wrong. But our intent is to create as much impact as we can. Um, with that... I will I will go back to you, Shilpa. I'm happy to answer questions and either now or I'm guessing later or in the Q and A tab on chat. No, there's that's a lot to unpack, Mekin, and you know uh, I'm going to just uh, say that it's really amazing how just people coming together, um, you know, and looking at things in brand new ways can have such sustainable and lasting impact. And uh, I'm going to come back to you with a bunch of questions. But um, maybe it's a good time to first get some thoughts in uh, from Abha, uh, who has been a, a different kind of doctor. Abha is the executive director, social finance, and founding member of Appreciation Trust. Uh, she led the development of a very new and different instrument in terms of raising money for philanthropy. Uh, she actually led the 11 million Quality Education India Development Impact Bonds at the Trust uh, in partnership with Michael and Susan Dell Foundation and UBS Optimus Foundation. Uh, she's a fellow of the Government Outcomes Lab, 
uh, University of Oxford. And she's really passionate in the approaches to finance and grant making as long as it enables positive impact on the ground. I think Abba, it'll uh, be great to hear from you on uh, how new instruments can be developed, uh, scaled to deliver better outcomes. Uh, and also your thoughts on uh, how can uh, you know funding from overseas be channeled into the country uh, at a time like this? Um, over to you, Abha. Thank you, Shilpa and God Merkin. You uh, you took away a lot of stuff I was going to talk about because my usual audience is in the UK, a uh, British Asian, and uh, and uh, and I talk mostly about how brilliant Swastar, how ACT is the best thing since sliced bread how volunteer networks uh, have led to the social change I've seen on the ground, and how at a time when none of us could come back to our country, that you made us feel that we could make a difference from so far away. Um, so, so kudos to you and, and several, many of you. I mean, Ajay from Swast being on, on top of my list of people, I, I, I think joins my, uh, my digital uh, religious prayers every day. Um, thank you very much, Shilpa and Grid, for having me. Uh, my name is Abha. I am one of the team members of the British Asian Trust. We set it up 10 years ago with several members of the South Asian business community in the UK with the intention to do one thing is to create platforms for giving together. And secondly, to showcase those causes that people don't want to give to mental health being a critical one that's risen to the top Shilpa, in this pandemic. Uh, and of course, something that we've been working on for years and years previous to that. My own passions within that, Shilpa, came from exactly a point you raised many, uh, you know, a few moments ago. You said a 100 crore organization didn't have 25 crores of flexible funding. As we started doing programming and grant making, that lack of flexibility and that constraint it gave nonprofits really tormented me. And when UBS Optimus and MSD have said to us, let's sit together and create the most flexible form of finance possible and totally focused on outcomes, at that time, a pipe dream because we couldn't even decide which outcome we wanted to fund or what, how we would measure it or who would pay for what. We were willing to get onto the table and say, yes, we're willing to draw funding to it. So the passion for that flexibility has always been there. And social finance for me is just that, flexible funding for better outcomes. It's much more complex as you start unpacking it, of course, and new forms of finance always are. But sitting underneath that is the desire to fund a longer term outcome allow things like behavior change to be funded and allow agility for partners. So you move money as needed. And I'll give you some examples as I speak. But taking a few steps back, so we are this platform in the UK. We've always been there. We are funded by several people and COVID hits. The first thing that happens in the community over there, because now I'm not going to tell you about what happened here because you are all here, is the community there becomes really insular. You turn inwards and start looking after your own. So the community was telling us we want to look after local communities, our doctors, our nurses, people in the NHS. So giving actually took an inward turn in the first wave for us. It's really interesting. And when we turned there and we were, we were showcasing the migration crisis with partners like Jan Saha's people we worked for with years, the first thing we would said is we want to serve those closest to us. The about turn we saw in the second wave was when this health crisis hit India. The UK was coming out of the second lockdown, several people had been through excruciatingly horrible times. And as we were coming out, India was going down and it, it hit a chord over there. And, you know, I don't, I wouldn't take any credit, but in five weeks, five million pounds poured out from communities. We are not an endowed fund. We had to raise money from the diaspora, from individuals, from leaders like JK Rowling, who donated from her foundation, from a book, Several other people, nameless, thankless, including people saying to us, my mother was in oxygen for three months. Yeah, I cannot imagine that happening to someone else. I need to give you money. So the outpouring of giving was a spontaneous re response to coming out of crisis ourselves for the television news that was being covered over there with the ability to come to us and said, say, we'll do it at scale. We did a few things. We made a few principal points, Shilpa, right up front. First, we said we won't replicate anything. It makes no sense when ACT Grants is putting in an order for us to put a counter order in with a Chinese manufacturer and raise the price of concentrators. So the first thing we did is over a weekend, this is the 24th of April, a weekend, very hard for me to forget. We spent the entire weekend saying, who do we know who's going to give us good advice? And we called up all current partners. So Adel Give Foundation, MSDF, and several others 
both on ground partners and foundation partners and said recommend people you want us to talk to and i'll be honest several roads led to act and swast um, that's the first thing go and we took recommendation second we had to count on our lawyers to make sure we, everything we did was legal kosher and able to be done really quickly so we took a transaction lawyer working on an impact bond transaction and said please help us nda jumped in over a weekend and sorted out sorted out papers really critical for foreign funding to come in and third we said we'll use not just money but we'll use our voice the british asian community is in parliament they are in the heads of organizations they are opinion leaders they are in the media and we reached out to all of them and said right work with us to do this at scale don't send individual concentrators don't create multiple supply chains you will make life more difficult for our on ground partners and when swast for example said to us can you talk to somebody in china we said yes we talk to the indian high commissioner because we can so whenever we could help we helped instead of saying let's replicate the one thing in the development sector and ingrid will know this everybody wants to be the bees knees in what they do the one thing we said is no we aren't the bees knees a ctr and we are just an enabler for them and whatever they need we should be doing the second thing on recommendation we took it many steps forward if swast said to us for example we are in uh, in rural andhra pradesh the tribal communities are struggling there and nandi foundation is doing something that needs funding we would immediately say right we might be doing concentrators with you right now but let's get nandi what they need so grassroots organizations were working with swast all the way across india and those recommendations from the volunteers in the field were really important i'll add another thing that we've talked about volunteering quite a lot but the, the moment the volunteering really hit home to me was when members of the diaspora started messaging us over the few days of that you know, the ends of april early may and i had i, I still recall it was sunday evening i just put the children to bed and there was a young girl who messaged me and said i've lost eight members of my family in delhi uh, i have somebody on a dialysis machine how can you get me help i don't even know who you are and i said to her listen it's 2 in the morning in india my volunteer network of swast will be it is asleep but i'll message them i messaged out within 20 minutes shilpa had help going to her house we suddenly realized that we were not just helping indians we were helping indians in the uk and out of that emerged programming around the indian community there where we said our network in india will help reach out to us and we will connect you the power of being able to do something when you're not in your own country is an is something you can't bottle up you know it's 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 a feeling they gave us the power to do that and we were we were recipients of that power and that grace uh, finally we also as a result of that talked to a mental health helpline a tech support helpline who offered us an entire set of resources for anybody in the diaspora who had dealt with bereavement dealt with any issues of crisis or anxiety with what was happening in india and that helpline rolled out the same helpline worked with the wandrawala foundation another organization based in india to support their own helplines in india so at that point you know, real life telephone lines had been closed text to support was required and they offered that out we also had doctors from the so the, the, the nhs is 30% indian doctors believe it or not and those doctors were volunteering with one of the act grant partners stepping stone and they were training them as we were doing it so we realized it was much more than the 5 million pounds or so that we gave it was actually the people we bought to it and the people swast and colleagues bought back to us it was a two way giving process and i have to really really underline that we didn't give we received we took we enhanced they gave us and we and we kept hearing and listening to each other if there was a challenge we worked through the challenge but we never said any i'm the giver you're the receiver it was at those times the lines were buzzing on both sides of the spectrum it's critical to note crisis takes away any kind of linear relationship anybody who works in linear fashions during a crisis can't achieve and i think several of the other speakers have talked about that so that's the sort of the covid part of it we also decided that once things go off headlines we shouldn't stop doing it so our entire focus is on recovery and that's where my my passion on outcomes comes back so that's where we are think we are now working with partners several existing partners on saying how do we continue to focus on those outcomes that might have been ignored during the crisis so whether it's gender and how do we drive flexible funding because if anything the next two years will need the most flexible funding to enable them to get communities back on their feet and that's really our focus in the next couple of years in addition on our quality education india dib at a time where funding was being taken out of education we as a group and this is the dells the uh, and all the other partners ubs decided that we will not take money out of qei dib we knew 
And I still remember the moment that the partnership met and we said, learning continues whether children are in school or not. Children were not in school, but learning has to happen. We're all parents and we know that. Let us allow our on-ground partners to figure out how they're going to get learning done. They're going to get their funding from the investor. And the investor took that leap. We took the leap of faith that we will change measurement of the outcomes through digital ways. We learned how to do that. We continued with the funding. Agility and aspiration when they come together can make the world a better place. And that's what we learned. I'm going to stop because I realize we have half an hour and there's a QA and a to follow and there's the brilliant Ganesh to come. So Ganesh, over to you. <laughs> yeah, th thanks, Abba. Uh, you know, can't agree with you more that, uh, you know, you spoke about two-way giving and receiving. I, I think that's such a wonderful, you know, thought. Uh, again, bunch of questions for you. But like you said, we're going to first uh, listen uh, to Ganesh. Ganesh, welcome. And uh, maybe a quick introduction for a benefit of those listening in. Uh, Ganesh is a successful serial disruptor. Uh, he has four successful greenful, uh, greenfield ventures and exits. He currently runs Growth Story. But um, he's the man behind uh, Big Basket, Portia Medical, Blue Stone, Fresh Menu. Uh, he actually, in March 2020, co-founded Social Initiative to feed uh, migrant and daily wage workers. And over a three-month period uh, was across five cities in India. Uh, in 2021, uh, like most of us, he also supported healthcare interventions uh, and, and focused on that as part of COVID-2. Uh, he has, of course, an illustrious background, uh, Board of Governors at IIM Calcutta and fellow alumni. Uh, He's held corporate roles at CEO of Bharti British Telecom. And uh, welcome, Ganesh. Over to you. Look forward to listening to what you have to say. Uh, you're on mute, Ganesh. Ganesh, you're on mute. Sorry. OK, uh, yeah. When uh, Ingrid uh, reached out to me uh, for this session, I thought there must be some miscommunication or mistake because while I have given, uh, I've spoken at startup events and being a startup entrepreneur over the last uh, 30 years plus, uh, never uh, been, uh, never done any philanthropy other than uh, some occasional giving to various charitable organization. So I said there must be a, must be a mistake, but Ingrid and I go back, we were one year apart at IM Calcutta. So I said, she does know me, so it can't be, it can't be a mistake. So uh, I was stunned and I was uh, aghast. And now listening to this illustrious speakers before me, uh, I feel humbled uh, that maybe I was actually right in thinking so. Uh, th thanks, thanks for being here. But on one hand, I think uh, this uh, having uh, started multiple startup, exited multiple startup, now in growth story, uh, doing multiple startup, I think I'm most qualified than most of you on this panel for nonprofit. None of my companies have ever made profit. Okay, right. So, 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 so the expertise. So, I think I'm, I'm, I'm more qualified than all of you because uh, of uh, the non-profit. It is not by, it is not by design that Big Basket or Portia Medical <laughs> or any of the companies don't make profit. But that's the way profits. That's the way startups are. So, 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 so that, that is, that is perfectly fine. Um, I've never done philanthropy or social sector people like Ingrid have dedicated their lives to uh, the entire careers to uh, social sector. So for me, again, it's great learning, listening to all of you, listening to all of you. My fir first active uh, work on social sector started uh, when the pandemic, pandemic hit. So whatever I'm going to share with you, please take it with a pinch of salt, a uh, bucket of salt, because I'm very, very, very new to this. And this is based on just the last one and a half years of my pandemic experience. And if you want to know where to buy that pinch of salt or bucket of salt, uh, you know it is Big Basket. And Ingrid has allowed me to mention, to allow two of my corporate mentions. So Big Basket will give you a discount if you put uh, Ingrid's name on it because e-commerce runs on discounts. So 2% discount on bucket of salt if Ingrid is the code. Okay, right, one. Uh, and the second caveat is if you have too much of salt and you are in trouble, uh, Portia Medical is always there to support you uh, for your health reasons. So I'm going to end. Okay, no more corporate, no more corporate mention. Let's get on to let's get on to the business. Thank you, Th thank you, and it's good. Lenny. 
So uh, when on the second day, uh, when the lockdown was on, first lockdown was announced in uh, March uh, in 2020, suddenly, unexpectedly, uh, was, I was watching television and as usual in various WhatsApp groups, bemoaning what's happening and moaning about it. Oh my God, chest beating and all that stuff. Then um, one of my friends called up and said, what can we do uh, now? This is just the second day. He said, what can we do now? Uh, uh, we don't have a foundation. We don't have a non-for-profit. We don't have a team. That is not a sector. What can we do? We can do, as usual, the response is we'll donate some money to uh, give India or Prime Minister's Relief Fund or whatever. That is when it stuck, saying that can we bring our network, our skills, and actually make a difference on the ground and make large impact. Donating some money to take away guilt feeling is good. Uh, get some ATG benefit and feel good about it and then go back to your WhatsApp uh, messaging and uh, doing that. Or can we do something? That is when we said, listen, this uh, pandemic has been sudden, has been uh, um, unexpected. So the migrant laborers suddenly see their livelihood gone. They have families to feed. They don't have saving. Can we at least ensure that the migrant laborers are able to feed themselves and their family while the rest of the world figures out how to handle At that time, we didn't even know how long the shutdown is going to be, what's going to lockdown, and all of that stuff. So we said, let's do that. Let's see if we can feed the migrant laborers in Bangalore. All the three of us who started this have full-time careers, full-time careers and uh, doing other things. None of us were full-time into any social or NGO or this. So can we do something to feed the migrant laborers? And let's do it in Bangalore. So our target was, can we feed 500 people a day in Bangalore? That's how we started. Uh, started small. Intention was to make a difference to be able to do that. And uh, very surprisingly, and that is, that, is, that is a transformative for me personally, uh, the way the journey took from 500 meals a day was what, what we had thought we would do to feeding during the first lockdown 6.5 million meals, 65 lakh meals across five cities. And the way it grew and the way we were fortunate to be able to play a role in actually feeding 65 lakh people has been a majorly major learning and humbling experience. So, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about talk about that. Obviously, the challenges for somebody like me with my background, not having done this before, not having an organization is very different. We have never done this before. We don't have an organization, a team, a volunteer, or not even one full-time employee focused on this. Uh, on the other side, there is full shutdown, logistics, presence. Even our own families had problem getting grocery into our family because I know I got so many calls uh, for Big Basket to intervene and help. Getting family help or a cook into the home was a challenge during lockdown. At the time, how are you going to get grocery for 500 people and feed people and deliver it and all that stuff, the permissions, the logistics for the vans to go? Uh, because this is not a critical sector, right? This is not emergency. You cannot call it healthcare. You cannot do this. How are you going to get a cook uh, go to cook the food? How are you going to get somebody to deliver the food? Getting actual on-ground volunteers to be able to do that and how to get the funding for... Uh, as it scales, what small scale, when we started, we said we are going to fund it ourselves because it was supposed to be small. So those were the challenges. And like normally that we do, we kept uh, the idea simple, saying, saying that let's use the startup playbook for this. Okay, right? We are just going to do go the way we would do an actual startup. I'm sure many of you will relate, make it relate, so will our relate. How do we uh, how do we uh, do a startup? So says, first, let's start with a minimum viable product. Okay, right? If we can do it in Bangalore, but do it in a scalable method, we should be able to go to other places. We did not intend the size and scale, but we wanted to expand it, obviously. Okay, right? So we said, how do we do that? We said, let's break it up into hub and smoke model. Okay, right? Let's have something centralized, a head office concept for doing this work, and then the regional office concept where we will break it up task into local task and central task. Right? That that is that is that's simple to do. So even though we are doing it small in Bangalore, the idea, the model is to be hub and spoke or uh, head office and regional office, central or local. Okay, right? Second, we said let's get strong founders like the way we do in startup, who are owners who can handle the local stuff and 
get heavy hitters right early into the game exactly like the startup where you bet on the founder and founder's capability to figure out the solution okay just as an example in chennai when we started this after the first 3 days in bangalore uh, we said how do we do chennai i am from chennai therefore we have obviously have a slight soft corner for chennai um, uh, so so we we do it uh, we shout to gopal shrinivasan of tbs capital tbs group saying that we want to do this we have a centralized playbook certain things are standardized here but we need local heavy eaters so he got the thai chennai angels and the thai chennai chapter to say that listen ganesh is good so can you work with him to be able to do that now that that took off the chennai chapter completely with 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 obviously central help from there okay right that the other the the other startup thing is look at the weakest link how do we handle the weakest link when we said we wanted to replicate in mumbai mumbai is very tough logistically and they were very strict on transportation on people movement and all of that so we have heard of stories of delivery boys getting beaten up we had challenges in potia medical in mumbai for the right reasons the cop were trying to stop everything and you know uh, doing that because people were taking advantage so we reached out to super cop ribero saying that can you please help us sir can you be the brand ambassador or can you be the face of it we need help to be able to navigate mumbai logistics for this the police and all that so he jumped up and said sure would you tell me what you want want to do that stuff so basically look at the weakest link and handle it we did that okay, right and specifically in each of these places it's horses for courses the way we would go about do it in chennai for example we worked very closely with chennai municipal corporation and used their resources network permission to be able to deliver the only place where we worked with the municipal corporation other cities we did not in noida for example we did large operation in noida because the need from noida came very very strong the district magistrate of noida and the people from noida came back we went to paytm vijay shekhar sharma and over just one hour like the way mekin mentioned earlier the way people jumped up he jumped up and said tell me what you want noida i want to i want to help i want to take care so entire noida was leveraged on the disproportionate help from paytm because it's headquartered in noida as you know and they had resources to be able to do it again remember this is at a time when the nation was facing a sudden lockdown so that is how we use startup example we created 400 volunteers 400 people across five cities working during lockdown working from home to deliver 65 lakh uh, meals obviously we had challenges we didn't have a foundation so we used one of the shell foundations that were there which was not doing so there was at least a a foundation and atg available no fcra but at least some platform was there so we said we can do that okay to the second thing like a typical entrepreneur we said be bold go for the stars don't wait improvise as you learn things you will figure out as you uh, as you go obviously the good part is that the world conspires to help you once you are clear and you go out there and put the stake on the ground we were able to leverage partnerships very 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 heavily both during the first phase and the second phase that was mentioned for the oxygen we have worked a lot with act grants again i can i can echo many of the things that mekin said those are those are his statements that those are actually true and it happened whether it's the speed or the the, the 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 lack of bureaucracy the way they put the money first to be able to do it whether okay, right so that, that happened in the second wave with act but give india for example uh, during the both in the first wave and the second wave came up with part of the money they said this is the money we know you guys will do it and do that stuff quick decision some process was there because they are responsible for their fiduciary responsibility to their donors but but very 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 quick to be able to do it so that obviously helped us in leveraging so partnership across the board whether it is paytm or in the first case we said we have to go across across to people at large to be able to raise money so the paytm app they put a ad in the paytm app paytm became uh, uh, helped us raise money micro payments there were students who were donating 10 rupees 20 rupees a day every day during the first round of pandemic to be able to feed the people they said this is what we can pay and similarly uh, in the second wave for oxygen supply we partnered with hindustan unilever so that is a great partnership they worldwide from 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 their resources imported 4000 oxygen concentrator okay right we partnered saying that how do we take it 
reach it free to people who need it in their house actually deliver it implement it train the people ensure it gets used after it is used when it's no longer required take it back sanitize it clean it to be able to do it we worked with potia medical which happens to be one of the companies to help us to be able to do that it was because potia medical is there in 16 cities it was able to actually do do this they were doing the management so about 10000 oxygen concentrators across the country in the homes were managed with the help of corporate so that's a great example this again it's an example where we were able to go to partners and say that listen we are doing this this is the gap if you if you chip in here if you participate here you can help solve the problem and how their participation is helped in leveraging was a great great example so these are these are these are things that we did basically used a full and complete uh, startup playbook uh, to deliver 65 lakh meals in the first phase of the pandemic and in the second wave actually give oxygen concentrators across the country free of cost with 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 partnership to be able to do that obviously uh, having never done uh, fundraise before ever uh, for a social cause we got benefit uh, from world over people from multiple countries we had 60 corporates and over 50000 retail donors who uh, donated to the uh, donated to the cause there has been huge learning on the behavioral side of it okay right having raised money from 26 different venture capitalists given exist to some working with people uh, venture capitalists multiple times same same one we work with sequoia and axel but never done it for the from individuals and never done it for a social cause there has been a lot of very interesting learning that we learned in terms of what appeals to people how to make people give again some of the standard principles of startup wherein how do you go to the top of the funnel how do you ensure that they convert how do you convert that they activate how do you how do you make them part with uh, how do you make them donate money how do you make them come back all of this has been great learning but happy to talk about it in the q and a session I'll hand it over back. I don't want to take more time. Thanks, Ganesh. It was so fascinating yeah. listening to you um, and and hearing about you know this disruptive approach to philanthropy. I think it was just great. Uh, let me now get to all the questions I've kind of stacked up listening to three of you. Uh, but first, you know, let me just draw a common thread. I, I think what came out from each one of the speakers. was you know one rupee can go a long way uh, it can go a long way in terms of impact it can go a long way in terms of causing sustainable change uh, it just depends on what skills and talents you bring together and encourage uh, to spend that money i thought that kind of came as a common theme what i loved though about you know what mekin and ganesh said was one of the approaches they brought table was this whole let's try new things let's reach for the stars if we fail let's come back to the drawing board and change things again uh i i know we have like 15 minutes left and uh, maybe i can first you know start off by uh ganesh asking you um, as you think back uh, you know your own experience starting off with you know relief work but ending up in a sense uh, actually with um, work that really focuses on deep change uh, what would you say is your biggest takeaway in terms of really sustaining things for the future in terms of you know being able to contribute to sustainable change for the future yeah so one uh, two things specifically uh, one is uh, you have to do it at scale that means you have to do it like a platform so that it is replicable okay otherwise it's it's almost like exactly in startup you can start a lifestyle company or a hobby you can start a boutique from your house or in a neighboring your house you can do that but that doesn't make it a mintra or amazon so like in a startup world it's okay it's perfectly fine for somebody to start a boutique company okay right but it will not create impact so one is can you do it in a platform method scalable method so that you are able to make large impact if that's what you you are setting out to do so that i think is 
is, is, is one big takeaway. Two is how do you make the model self-sustainable or a virtuous cycle so that it doesn't continuously depend on grants every time because grants will run out. So if you can create a virtuous cycle by which you are able to able to do this, that is fine. Let me give an example. In case of during the second uh, second wave, when we saw the challenges for oxygen, challenges for level two facilities, challenges why uh, public infra health infrastructure is getting stretched. Okay, one immediate thing to address the loss of life and the gasping for oxygen that's happening. All of us did what we did. Oxygen did it. We did one more thing, uh, uh, upgrading the level uh, two COVID care center facilities of government to next level to be able to handle uh, not just oxygen, but also ICU and, and, and other things by doing whatever is required, doing the gap funding and providing the gap resources. But that also is intervention, not self-sustaining. So the second thing I'm talking about, can we make it self-sustaining? So now we are, I'm working on a project called Community Healthcare Entrepreneur where you use some of the money, some of the grants, both government and from foundation and all of those, but can I enable a local community person to become a healthcare entrepreneur in a, in a six months to 12 months time with some subsidy and support, but within that time, make the person independent so that they are able to actually start earning money so that it continues on an ongoing ever basis, making a community healthcare entrepreneur with subsidy or viability gap funding. This again is a startup thing wherein like the angel investment you raise to be able to get to a level of either profitability or get to institutional funding. Same thing if you can do the grant, then you are leveraging one rupee, not for that time, but permanently forever. So those are my learnings for it to be sustaining a platform scalable methodology to make maximum impact and to a virtuous cycle to make sustaining like the community healthcare entrepreneur, happy to talk about it uh, to all the participants offline to be able to see how to work that thing together. Thank you, thank you. And um, uh, you know, just for me, the takeaway is you said strengthening it for sustainability and just again underline the importance of more funding to really grow the organization first. Um, and uh, Abba, with that, let me come to you, same question to you. How do you sustain change? Um, great question. And, and just to fly the philanthropy flag, all these entrepreneurs and uh, venture capitalists are taking away for the fact that this is our bread and butter business. So maybe I should fly a little bit of a flag for what the community of philanthropists and funders have taken away and should take away from this Shilpa. Uh, for scale and sustainability, firstly, learn from a crisis. Nothing teaches you more than a crisis, or nothing teaches you something more than when something goes wrong. If we come out of this space as philanthropists and as intermediaries having not learned, we are absolutely daft. And I can say that for myself. I know Ingrid would say it the entire sector, but I, I tell myself every day, what is COVID taught me? I should not, what should I stop doing? What should I keep doing? What should I be doing? Better? That's a mantra we have across the organization. That's one. Two is within philanthropy, one of the things that causes inertia and doesn't allow scale and agility in the way Ganesh Belkin have talked about is our focus on systems and due diligence and MEL, governance and paperwork. If we can leverage technology to do some of that. So let me give you an example. When I was pitching Swast in front of 100 donors, uh, communities in the UK, the only thing I needed to use was their technology platform and how OC concentrators went. In half a second, my sale was made and done. Now, something about technology sales over there taught me that if we can focus our minds and get a, get a better metal process, um, monitoring and evaluation and learning processes going, we as a sector would improve. So. A pitch for the sector to be self-reflecting. Do what you do well, but really change what you're not doing well if it's constraining the sector by giving grants that don't work so that we're up for criticism by the wider community. And I'm sure Ingrid would add thoughts to that one as well as Shilpa, you too. No, for sure. Uh, you know, I, I think it's really a time for self-reflection when uh, at times of need, you know, the point I'd get about 150 crores being available and you can't do a thing. Uh, I, I think it's certainly pause for reflection in terms of what we can do to change practices. But uh, Makin, let me quickly get your thoughts. Uh, 
how do you think when keep the covid moments uh, you know push for change how can we sustain that or to really solve our deepest biggest problems um shilpa i don't know the answer uh, right i i can tell you what i feel might work um i feel what would really work is to back entrepreneurs who want to make that change the mission for their life right uh none of us are going to stick to one problem uh and stay with it for the course it takes most of almost all of these societal challenges are very hard problems uh like any business like building uh, like building a flipkart is a very hard problem uh, and you need entrepreneurs who will stay with the problem uh and not have to switch based on where money is available or where money is not so first and foremost is to find and support entrepreneurs for whom that problem or that social change that system is their mission uh, then it is about to play uh, and i think um, mr kurian says this probably best in his book uh, and it's among the most inspiring books for me uh, mr kurian of amul uh, right that if professionals can play a role of supporting and enabling creators the society and economy we will have will be far more robust right so if professionals can be and professionals like philanthropists professionals who are uh, who build who bring in skills and capacities can be in service of entrepreneurs who are driving the change uh, i feel like we would we would go create something that's sustainable because i i don't think uh, i don't think that systems can be created or uh, change can be created overnight uh, or by people for whom it is a purely analytical problem uh, it it's something where people have to take i and by no means do i want to demean the analysis and thinking and like i feel strategy product design all of that have immense role to play technology can be a huge enabler eventually somebody has to take that to ground somebody has to listen to the my preferred word is customer and not beneficiary because i feel a lot more hierarchy in the word beneficiary uh, somebody has to listen to the customers and iterate and those iterations take time uh, those improvements take time um, and in my head like there will like nobody is invested in doing those iterations barring the entrepreneur so in my head i think the short answer is to find entrepreneurs who have uh, the longing for solving that problem uh, and will not rest till the problem is solved and then to just back them yeah no wonderfully said mekin can't uh, agree more with you and let me now quickly go back in reverse direction starting with the point you made mekin which is okay let's you know those entrepreneurs who are passionate dedicated driven to see change how do we support them and you know i'm just reminded about 20 years ago i remember uh, listening to raghuram rajan and that time he was bemoaning the lack of angel investors to invest in entrepreneurs in india now uh, it's true i i i mean I, i can vouch for that there was a time when there were no angel investors in india and and now you have a real big ecosystem of people who support entrepreneurs who support work let me flip that around and say okay now that we disrupt we are talking disruption of philanthropy uh, the fact that there are many entrepreneurs dedicated to the cause how do we create an ecosystem which brings in skills money and whatever it takes to help these entrepreneurs solve their problems so let me go back in the reverse order to all three starting with you mekin yeah i i feel what covid uh, and i think abha put it well the outpour of humanity right like what covid showed us is that that every human has a heart and a heart willing to give uh, right it's and in general we have known in non profits or in the development sector that disasters bring that out the fastest uh, like and and sometimes we bemoan it that uh, oh like you have you have instantaneous money available for floods uh, right but you have no money available for people suffering from long term hunger or malnutrition 
which show its impact over a much, much longer period of time. And I think it is, again, uh, in some sense, the duty of the entrepreneur to be able to, uh, and forgive me for using corporate or startup words, to market to the audience, convince them about what, uh, what needs to be done. I think in terms of what is the enabling environment for them, uh, there's a lot, and I think Ingrid is probably much better place to answer that question. But starting from policy, I talked about the first three years. Uh, we need a lot more people. We need a lot more entrepreneurs trying to solve these problems. And many will start, many will fail. That's the story of startups. Uh, that's what the startup ecosystems told us. That, like Flipkart, once the possibly the first most successful startup was built on the dead bodies of many, many, many startups that tried but failed. And Flipkart had the luxury or to be able to stand on their shoulders to learn from all of them and figure all of that out. We need, like, we need a lot more nonprofits, and we need to be okay with nonprofits not succeeding, not as in ideas not working, some particular entrepreneur not being able to solve a problem, not being able to hire a good team, not being able to execute, and it's okay, like it's it, it shouldn't it shouldn't stop us from continuing to support more and more people because over 20 we will find one or two who would solve it in a way that will scale so first is like how do you enable a lot more early stage entrepreneurship to happen in the nonprofit space and uh, there is stuff to be done on the policy side but i have stopped uh, waiting for government and politicians to fix our problems i feel it's us who need to start getting to do stuff so we as philanthropists, like what can we do to start supporting a lot more early stage enterprises, early stage nonprofits? I think besides money, right? how do you get into conversations about, hey, what are the problems they are having and how can you enable them? How can you solve with them? Uh, whether it is like Ava talked about connections with the Chinese commission or figuring out supply chain problems, figuring out supply or a certain geography like Vijay and Noida and and I think opening doors, connecting, problem solving together, helping them see technology solutions, depending on strengths you bring in, you expose them. And you may not have all the answers, uh, but you, you support these people and put their voice to many other people. And hopefully, the ecosystem will start solving them some of these problems. Yeah, no, th thanks, uh, Mekin. Uh, Ingrid, uh, just a quick question to you. I know it's almost 1.30. Uh, is it like sudden stop or do we have flexibility of five minutes, you know? I, I think you can probably go. I, I, I don't know, truthfully, maybe if oh, right. Sakshi is on the, on the on the platform, she can let us know. Right. I'm here and we can continue for the next couple of minutes. Not a problem at all. Thank, Thank you. you, Sakshi. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Abha, uh, you know, let me move to you. Same question. Um, Getting early stage entrepreneurs, what next? How can we support them? Right. Can I make a more controversial point? Can I not talk about the entrepreneurs, but talk about the funders who need to behave like entrepreneurs? Can oh, we just okay. take a call to action to funding communities that the problem is not always to be solved by the entrepreneur, that perhaps as a funding community and a giving community, we are agile. We think about our own challenges. We are self-reflective, as again saying, the entrepreneurs there, they have to do this. We have to do this for them. What do we do ourselves that make us bigger operators, more entrepreneurial, and really take our passions to where they matter? If we care about flexible funding, let's live and die for it. Let's not get back into old systems because, hey, that's an easier job. So just, just that. So if other others here as well. Please ask Ingrid what she thinks. She always has brilliant ideas. <laughs> Double click on that. And um, you know, Ingrid, I'm going to give you the last word before I wrap up. So. Uh, Ganesh, over to you. Uh, same question. Yeah. So uh, again, I think people, uh, uh, others who have done this at scale and I've been doing it for multiple years will be better answered. But I'll tell you my own experience because when we started suddenly and we had to raise money and all that stuff, we used like the way we do in startup, uh, uh, we use data that was available. So we looked at what is working, what is not working, because we had to quickly, every day, we, every day people were suffering and we had to raise money. So we had to do it very quick. So the luxury of learning was not there. So, but we used data. So some of the very interesting things that we learned, and we, this was published in Stanford uh, Social Review as an article, 
on the behavior aspect of what will make people move and actually contribute okay right so one we realize is making uh, taking action by a person relevant to a core identity okay right so can i link is there effective way to inspire action by creating a link between the desired action such as volunteering or donating to a target person self image okay right that really helped us in terms of trying to do this so if you are able to relate it to the, their identity uh, then it really uh, motivates people to actually act that was that uh, that was one okay right so in initial messaging we said no one goes hungry okay right the no one goes hungry includes all of us so that automatically moved the thing second thing that we realized was we started by saying we uh, feed my city and all that but tailoring the message to local area is lot more powerful if you feel in your neighborhood somebody is suffering a laborer is suffering and therefore you need to feed you are more motivated to act than a generic thing saying that feed my city so what we did through paytm was we found out where the person is coming from is clicking on the paytm app then we used to say that in that koramangala area yesterday we were able to serve 5000 meals but the need there is for 8000 meals you can help feed 10 more people in koramangala now because the data and the technology allowed us to micro target you as a donor we are able to we are able to do that the third thing was that can we actually make it personal can we instead of saying generally help people in west africa or people help in developed countries what they call it as identifiable victim effect can you actually make uh, identifiable victim effect if you can't feed 100 people just feed one and feed one in koramangala that i think actually helped us and we actually had data to be able to prove it and i can go on and on but i just start with this stop with one one of very interesting thing that we learned was when we used to put social media messaging and imaging for feeding the people okay when it had a positive message okay right a happy person receiving food it got liked and shared a lot but actual donations were very very less okay right they were not giving but when we used stark images when we actually showed people suffering when we put children when we put women then even though the sharing was not there but people were shocked people were not happy people were moved but the donations increased substantially so i would say that going forward in terms of raising money whether it is appealing to corporations whether it's appealing to individuals using data using science using principles that we use in startup can make a made impact one one last point in corporations when we went to for money in the first wave they all had committed to prime minister's relief fund now pm relief fund is big corporations like pm relief fund because they get to publish and i'm not saying in the negative way they like get brownie points by donating this top industrial houses had donated 500 crores they said we have no money we have donated 500 crores then we said this is like a typical startup competition how am i going to differentiate myself vis-a-vis somebody else how am i going to get the money i'm competing with uh, prime minister's relief fund for funding how am i going to do that so then this idea came that corporations will love this but individuals don't want to donate to india they want to donate to their local for a specific cause specific people identifiable victim which prime minister's relief fund can't do so this helped us so tapping into emotions tapping into uh, analyzing the competition uh, helped us a lot so these are some of the learnings on how we managed to growth hack funding uh, on the go during the first two month period like i said to feed 65 uh, uh, lakh people uh, we had to uh, we, we raised money from corporations and individuals thanks to all of this yeah no really great to hear how you used your playbook for that one uh, ganesh and ingrid you know i think we'll take 5 minutes to hear from you Uh, you've been a, a, a veteran of this sector compared to most of us, and would love to see how you think. Uh, you know, what's new, what's worked, uh, and and uh, you know what can sustain. Would love to hear from you. It would be hard to sum up. I mean, I've I probably learned more in the last ninety minutes than I have in a very long time. Uh, Ganesh certainly seems to have learned as much about fundraising as I've learned in my entire career in the <laughs> sector. Um, but 
I think that there are two things that are striking me about today's conversation. One is how do you solve for trust? A lot of what we've talked about, whether it's scale or whether it's agility, was possible because people were leveraging relationships of trust. And of course, in the nonprofit sector, that is most of the time sorely lacking. You're actually operating at the opposite end of the scale of high levels of skepticism, high levels yeah. of, of mistrust. So, but I think what, I, what I'm taking away from this is what are the assets that, that you might have as a nonprofit or as a social entrepreneur? Are they your board members, your connections, people you worked with, people you went to school with, whatever? How can you leverage all of those to solve for trust is I think one big takeaway I got. I think the second one is, you know, we sit in our silos. Uh, I'm constantly meeting people exactly like me and you're probably meeting people exactly like you. Um, and we're divided not just by our professions and our professional interests, but also by a lack of mutual respect. And this is mutual, I want to stress. You know, it, I, I, I can bring you as many activists who have complete disdain uh, for entrepreneurship and startups as I can bring you startups and entrepreneurs who have complete disdain uh, for grassroots activism. But I think what the pandemic did in some ways was force us out of our silos and force us into these marriages of convenience, you might call them, but which then allowed us to sort of draw on many different mindsets, many different perspectives, many different pools of knowledge, uh, many different skills. So I'm going to go back in some senses to, um, you know, there are four things we need to focus on. One is how, like Ganesh talked about, how do we build that, that uh, repository of knowledge that we can all draw from much more easily so we're not having to reinvent each other's wheels uh, how do we build networks not just within our sectors but across sectors so that we can benefit from these different mindsets uh, how do we shift the norms what Abba spoke about which is how do we get you know, how does the 28 day uh, decision making cycle become the norm rather than the six month or 12 month uh, decision making cycle. Um, and finally, how do we build better narratives? I think uh, uh, running through the, 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 the all of you uh, speaking today are how do you turn data or a problem into a compelling story? Um, so I'm going back to my mantra in some ways, which is knowledge networks, norms, and narratives, um, but with a, a new twist, which is, I think, how do we cross-fertilize better across sectors and across mindsets and across countries? And I just want to thank all of you. This has been a fantastic conversation from my selfish perspective. Um, and um, I look forward to carrying it on with each of you individually and collectively, just as if I, if I may be permitted one um, sort of corporate uh, message. For us, this whole disrupt philanthropy track is an elaborate beta test for a set of programs that we hope to run where we're actually going to convene people like you in larger groups to see uh, what magic we can make happen. So look forward uh, to seeing you all again um, in another space at another time. Uh, thanks, Ingrid. I think you, thank you. Really brought uh, all of this together so well. Uh, thank you again. I, I think it was such a great discussion. Uh, I think we always talk about crisis as an opportunity. Uh, and, uh, you know, COVID brought many, many, you know, difficult, distressful things into our lives uh, but at the same time i think what you know this last one and a half hours shows is the hope uh, and the change uh, that you know uh, just human effort uh, can, can achieve uh, and um, big message i take away is uh, nothing is difficult shoot for the stars uh, you can take care of the most difficult problems by crowding in, you know, support, money, skills, talent, all of those good things.
Uh, on that note, uh, let me thank uh, each one of you, Mekin, Ganesh, Abha, most of all Ingrid for putting this together, and to the CSIP team and Gautam, uh, thank you very much. And lastly, to the Nudge Foundation. Thank you, Shilpa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Shilpa. Thanks, Ingrid. Thanks, Ganesh. Thank